25th Annual Dementia Friendly Tempe Summit. My name is Jan Doherty and I have the privilege to be the moderator of this amazing program here this morning. Uh, we were scheduled to have this program back in uh, March, April timeframe and then as we all know life changed. So we're happy that we can join you here today in a virtual way which is new for many and uh, we are going to do our very best to avoid uh, some of the blips that can happen in our virtual world. Uh, just a bit about me, I'm a nurse, I am a Tempe resident and as a member of the Banner Alzheimer's Institute staff uh, I had the privilege of uh, joining in this effort in uh, 2016 as Tempe launched as one of the very first dementia friendly communities in the United States under the leadership of our former mayor Mark Mitchell. Uh, we are joined by a group of amazing community volunteers called the Dementia Friendly Action Team and it's this group that has really put this uh, uh, program together for you today. So before we start, I just want to go through a couple of housekeeping uh, rules, if you will, that will help us with this virtual meeting. The first is just please know that we will record this meeting and it will be uploaded to the Dementia Friendly Tempe website early next week. So if you have to leave early or if you would uh, like to share it with perhaps others in your network, we'd encourage you to uh, send them the link. Uh, the first thing I want to do though is we are going to ask all of our participants to mute themselves as well as to stop their video feed. So there's a couple ways that you can do this. You'll find we are using Microsoft Teams and you will have a bar either on the top right of your screen or perhaps if you uh, take your cursor and you move it over kind of the lower center portion of your, of your screen, a bar will pop up and you will see a, a video camera icon we're going to ask you just to click on that and there should be a line that goes through that so that we are not uh, seeing your face not because we're not interested but it, it really does uh, interfere with the recording of this the next thing you are likely to see should be uh, an icon that looks like a microphone. Once again, we're going to ask you to click on that so that you can mute yourself. And that way, should your phone ring, your doorbell ring, your dog bark, uh, the, the participants will not be distracted from that. And then finally, because this is an interactive session, we want you to be able to ask questions of our participants. So as you scroll across that bar again, you are gonna see what looks to be like a thought bubble with some lines through it. And if you click on that particular bar, what it will do is it will allow you to go ahead and type in a question or a comment. It will say show conversation. And as you click on that, we're going to invite you to do that now. Perhaps you'd like to try a practice and write in good morning. And that way you will be comfortable as you go ahead and try to provide a question or a comment. Again, we will be collecting these throughout the summit here this morning. And we should have at least uh, 30 minutes to spend in discussion with our panel at the end of the presentation. So I see lots of good mornings popping up and good morning to you and how fortunate we are that each one of you are able to join us. So as we start our morning here and before we get into our program, um, I would like to introduce council member Doreen Garland. I've had the privilege of meeting Doreen over a number of years and she has been, she's a newly elected member to our council and um, I can tell you that Darlene uh, has also been a family caregiver for a mom who uh, lived with dementia and she and former uh, Mayor Mitchell hosted one of our very first dementia friends sessions in her home. So she was committed to helping other neighbors and members of her community know what dementia looks like and how to respond. So Doreen, I'm gonna ask you to join us and, and provide us some comments and accomplishments that we've seen in this past year with Dementia Friendly Tempe, welcome. Thank you and good morning. I am Doreen Garland. Tempe City Council member, and I want to welcome you to the fifth annual Dementia Friendly 
Tempe Summit. But I'd first like to say something on a personal note, that the dementia family um, was so helpful to me when I found out that my father had Alzheimer's and I became his caregiver. Through a dementia friend seminar, becoming a dementia champion, attending a summit, hosting an information session for my neighborhood and attending a few support group meetings, I and my siblings were able to walk gracefully with my father through this disease. As you know, Alzheimer's comes with good days and tough days. I cherish the days that my dad had clarity. And when he didn't quite remember me, I look for the moments that were special. Like the day we were in the grocery store and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, I don't know who you are, but I know that you love me. That was a special moment. This summit is a cornerstone of dementia friendly Tempe and we are happy to see so many people taking part in our first ever virtual event. Dementia friendly Tempe is part of the dementia friendly America and is the first dementia friendly city in Arizona. The city of Tempe partners with Banner Alzheimer's Institute to bring the city of Tempe programs, information and resources to help residents learn and understand more about Alzheimer's disease and dementia related diseases. As you might have guessed, Dementia Friendly Tempe has shifted its work during the pandemic to meet the needs of people living with dementia and their caregivers. Our city of Tempe staff and the dedicated volunteers with our DFT action team went right to work to continue providing support for our community. This shift included the creation of virtual caregiver support group, which has provided critical lifeline to many. Regular phone calls to stay connected to caregivers in need of extra assistance. A weekly message to family caregivers and community members to share resources and help them feel supported. The continuation of DFT presents our monthly lectures in a virtual format. Virtual opportunities for community members to participate in Dementia Friends training to build awareness of dementia and reduce stigma. And of course, offering this summit virtually to help all our citizens during these most unusual times. Tempe is proud to be a dementia friendly city and a statewide leader, helping raise awareness and provide resources to those in need. We have been a resource to other cities now becoming dementia friendly. And I would like to recognize the efforts of Sun Lakes community, the city of Surprise, the city of Phoenix, and the city of Mesa. This work could not be done without the leadership provided by Banner Alzheimer's Institute and their continued partnership with Tempe and these other cities. And we are grateful for their support and vision. I would like to recognize our Tempe City employees for their support during this time, including Human Services Supervisor Allie Burke and Senior Social Services Coordinator Candace Hewitt. Finally, I want to recognize Dr. Carol Lockhart, who is an active member of our DFT action team. Dr. Lockhart recently lost her battle with pancreatic cancer. She and her husband, Woody Wilson, have long been change agents and community activists. As a nurse, faculty member, and policymaker, Carol was quick to join us when our Dementia Friendly Initiative began. As a lifelong educator, she used her talent to help in educating our fire and police personnel to become dementia friends. This was a cause she cared deeply about. With her husband, Woody, she also helped to bring creative arts programs to the DFT community. Dr. Lockhart will be missed, but her efforts will live on through this continued work and the city's commitment to dementia friendly communities. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives to join us for this virtual summit. We have an amazing panel of experts lined up and I know the information they are sharing today will help you live well, even in these uncertain times. Now I would like to welcome our moderator, Jen Doherty, to begin the event with the Dementia Friendly Inspiration Award. Thank you, Doreen, for your comments. And uh, I'm happy to 
uh, welcome and congratulate Ms. Cindy O'Connell and Ms. Susie Peck for their work uh, as part of the Memory Cafe that's been a hallmark of Dementia Friendly Tempe. As we started this work uh, with Memory Cafes, it was very clear to us that our care partners needed added support, education, and strategies so that they could be successful in caring for the person that they love so much. And these two women were like angels from above that came to us not only as professional women, uh, Cindy as a licensed clinical social worker, Susie as an assistant superintendent of schools, but they were women who found themselves caring for husbands who were affected by dementia. And they have both taken their knowledge and their skills to um, lead a support group of mighty care partners who continue to grow and learn and inspire each one of us. When we uh, ran into this unusual time of having to live with COVID and closing our face-to-face -face meetings that we look forward to in such an important way, Susie and Cindy immediately stepped up and said it is essential that our members have access to both our phone numbers and our emails. We need to stay uh, connected and supported. So I can't think of two uh, more worthy people who inspire me to just want to make a difference because these ladies are truly making a difference in our community and the lives of our families. So I'm going to ask both Cindy and Susie to um, go ahead and uh, un unmute your microphone. And Cindy, if you would want to make a couple comments followed by Susie, we'd welcome to hear from you. Well, I am surprised and honored to receive this inspiration award from Dementia Friendly. My journey with Alzheimer's began when my husband of 31 years was diagnosed with this disease. In the beginning, he experienced forgetfulness of everyday events that was annoying, but I thought we were handling it well. It wasn't until four years later when we experienced a crisis that I realized I was over my head in understanding what was going on with him. It was at that time I joined a support group sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association in Tucson. I can really say it saved my life and certainly helped his remaining five years. As I learned about common behaviors and beneficial ways to cope with these behaviors, I gained confidence and some peace of mind. I leaned on that group to help me become the best caregiver I could become. Because of my experience with my support group, I became committed to helping other caregivers on their journey. Knowledge and understanding are powerful tools in dealing with dementia. When I share a tip or some understanding about a disturbing behavior, I feel I'm giving back. It feeds me. So as this inspiration award is meant to honor me, I want to say I receive more than I give from working with these wonderful caregivers at Memory Cafe. Thanks to them, I share their journey. Thank you. Susie, if you'd like to unmute. Hey, Cindy, that was beautiful. Um, like Cindy, about halfway through my husband's 11-year trek with dementia, I joined a support group and could not believe the difference between having that once a month, three hour connection and my prior caregiving for Danny. After he passed, um, I found myself lost, but was lucky enough to have uh, our daughter ask me to substitute for her one day at the uh, dementia friendly Tempe memory cafe. I had limited knowledge, but I had nothing else to do. I couldn't conjure an excuse, so I agreed to go. Uh, that was the summer that my husband passed away, and that was the beginning 
of the Memory Cafe. Uh, with the exception of a couple trips to visit my son in Minnesota, I have not missed a single opportunity to be with these heroes we call caregivers. And like Cindy, I am honored to have been given the Inspiration Award, but would love to share it with all of our heroes because um, I feed off them still. I didn't know who I was initially after Danny passed. And thanks to um, the caregivers being willing to share their stories, ask questions, give suggestions, and let me be a part of that, I know who I am. And even though my husband passed from dementia, and initially I wanted to run away from it as fast as I could, I've learned to embrace both he and I, who we were before dementia, who we became, and now my, my great opportunity to volunteer. There's a bunch of people that work very hard from the city of Tempe and from Banner to make this happen. And I'm in awe of all of you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And I think uh, for those listening in, you get a sense of why these uh, two women inspire us and inspire the partners that they support uh, as they continue to meet in a virtual format, which you're going to hear more about later in our program. But now it's time for us to move forward uh, to talk about how to live well with dementia during uncertain times. And we are joined by just an incredible panel of speakers and authorities on uh, this particular topic. And this idea of living well with dementia comes from uh, a, really a model being used in the United Kingdom where they look at how important it is to prevent well, how important it is to diagnose well, how important it is to support well the, the care partners who join in this effort in caring for the person they, they love, the importance of living well for the person who is living with dementia and how we can enhance daily life, and then finally planning well because we know that this is a disease state that will have twists and turns along the way. So joining me, and I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they will speak, you will see their beautiful faces on the slide deck as we move forward. And then when we go into our question and answer period, they will take off the video uh, feed so that they can, um, you can look at them directly. But to begin, Dr. Ganesh, Gopala Krishna, we call him Dr. G lovingly. He is a geriatric psychiatrist and associate director of the Memory Disorder Center at the Banner Alzheimer's Institute. And he's going to lead us through preventing well and diagnosing well. As we talk about supporting well, Ms. Susie Favaro is a licensed clinical social worker at the Banner Alzheimer's Institute. She will be joined by Carmen Ferguson who is a care partner as she has been caring for her husband, Carl. She is a member of our Dementia Friendly Memory Cafe where she imparts just a calm presence and a wisdom of things that she's learned along the way. As we move on and talk about living well, our focus will turn to how we can help the person who is affected by dementia to live well. And Ms. Carolyn Hutchins, who is the director of the Tempe Adult Daycare Program, will speak to some innovative ways we can help keep our loved one engaged. And she will be followed by Anastasia Johnstone, who is a lovely woman who was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia, but she is more than a person who just lives with dementia. She is a person who cares for her aging parents, as well as a mom to an amazing son who is now in college. And then finally, as we talk about planning well, we are uh, elated to have Elaine poker Yant join us. She works for the Visiting Angels of the East Valleys, but she's an advocate. She is a boots on the ground kind of person who helps people problem solve. And she's also a columnist with the Arizona Republic where she writes a routine column on aging and age related matters. And uh, she has been very instrumental in the Sun Lakes uh, Memory Cafe as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn this uh, conversation over to Dr. G as he begins to talk to us about preventing well and, and diagnosing well. Dr. G, welcome. Thank you, Jan. Um, 
So first of all, I would like to thank Jane Doherty to invite me to meet you all and uh, give my insights about uh, some of these topics. I also uh, want to congratulate Cindy and Susie for this award they won. So congratulations. Uh, and finally, I also want to thank everybody joining us. Uh, I know this is a weekend and you have a lot of other things to do, but I appreciate all the panelists and our participants to be here today. So uh, here's the outline of uh, what I'm going to just discuss about. So we'll talk about what are the risk factors uh, which can put you at a higher risk or a lower risk for dementia, uh, why it is important to diagnose and where to seek help. I'll be using some important studies to just illustrate the points and where I'm coming up with those recommendations or conclusions. Um, so you can look up those studies and there are a couple slides where um, I'm just going to give information. So if you have access to this power, uh, you know, the slide deck, you can go back and look at it. Next slide, please. So uh, this is uh, just a, I don't know how to do a vote on uh, teams and I'm not going to put you all through this, but just to think about when we say incidence is the number of people being diagnosed with dementia uh, for every 100,000 people. So uh, I just to reflect, uh, do you think it has increased or decreased in the last decade? So when I ask these questions to even medical students, most of the people, they say that it's increased because we are seeing a lot more dementia patients, but it actually has gone down. Uh, and a lot of this is related to uh, the changes that we have done over the last few decades. And we'll talk about that. Next slide, please. So there's uh, uh, the improvements in uh, you know our incidence rates are uh, attributed to the higher education levels. Yeah, the average education levels have gone up over years over the last uh, few decades. Our nutrition has improved. Uh, our healthcare. Um, when we say healthcare, people are getting their hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes treated early. So we are trying to we are mitigating those insults to the brain. There's also, um, as you will see, as we uh, go through the slide deck, there's a lot of lifestyle changes which have great benefits for your brain health. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we'll start with this finger study. Uh, this is again one of those studies which is often cited. So they took about 1,200 people aged between 60 to 77, and uh, they gave an intervention of um, a, changes with their lifestyle factors that included, you know, um, physical exercise, keeping them busy uh, uh, cognitively. And after two years, um, you know, 25% uh, more uh, improvement in the intervention group, like where people got intervention compared to people who did not get all those physical exercise and everything. And these improvements were regardless of the socioeconomic factors. And people who had a genetic higher risk uh, of con uh, having Alzheimer's disease had a clear benefit from this intervention. Uh, so they uh, had a reduced risk of developing new chronic diseases such as heart diseases. Uh, they also declined slower on functional decline, which means that the ability to do things such as cooking, driving, um, taking care of yourself, managing finances, all those things had a reduced risk of decline uh, when you compare people who got the intervention for not. They also had an improved health-related quality of life, which we really want to focus a lot. We want to focus on the quality of life uh, in addition to the longevity of life. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, paper that I uh, refer to, and uh, I'll go through over some of those uh, recommendations. So they went and looked at all the evidence and found uh, 10 factors to be the uh, deciding thing which uh, influences risk. Next slide, please. So these were um, the risk factors that they identified. Now here, uh, I wanna focus on the first, the title of the slide, which is the modifiable, modifiable risk factors. So in, in a lot of disease models, uh, like hypertension, diabetes, like the chronic diseases, we tend to look at risk factors into two main categories, non-modifiable, which is things like age, you cannot change that, your gender, uh, your genetic makeup, all those things fall under the non-modifiable risk factors. The modifiable risk factors are the one that I'm going to spend a lot of time on today. So uh, 
people with less education uh, always have a higher risk of developing dementia in the later life. We attribute that to how much brain circuits they have built in uh, when in the early life and they're learning new things. And, and this also kind of translates even to middle and uh, late stages of uh, your life too. Uh, we'll talk about hypertension, hearing impairment um, in detail. Smoking, if uh, people quit smoking at least by midlife, you know, that helps a lot with your risk. Otherwise, it is a risk for developing dementia. You know, obesity kind of uh, falls for diabetes and hypertension, so that uh, it's a confounding factor there. We'll talk about physical inactivity, low social contact, and what a point to discuss in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we have seen so many families struggle um, recently, you know, when people are having dementia, or even uh, without it, you see that people decline when they're not allowed to see their families and they're not allowed to see uh, their friends and have, play card games. They miss it so much. People go into depression and uh, it has an adverse outcome to uh, your cognition. So uh, people who have had good social contact and socialization skills tend to preserve their memory much longer. So excessive alcohol consumption, which uh, it has been difficult to define, and this, uh, the evidence is not very clear, but uh, people who drink more than one uh, drink a day or more than two drinks a day uh, are at a higher risk compared to people who drink one drink a day. Um, so that, that has been kind of consistent, but uh, does it help in a lower doses is not very clear. We'll talk about uh, traumatic brain injury. Air pollution is one of the things that they added this time compared to 2012, this group. Next slide, please. So here's, uh, and this is a factor that I go over with my patients all the time in the clinic. Uh, and once I pick up that, you know, this person is having difficulty hearing me during the interview, I always educate them as to what the risk uh, it has on dementia. So it has the highest risk of all these modifiable risk factors. So think about this. If a person is not able to interact with people and uh, they're not able to hear, the most common reaction for people is they kind of isolate and they say, you know, I, I don't want to embarrass myself asking over and over again. So that reduces your socialization, increases your risk of depression and less input to your brain means uh, more risk of dementia. And, you know, they've kind of narrowed it down even further. Every, there's a cognitive kind of decline for every 10 decibels uh, loss of hearing. So that's pretty, uh, you know, significant. And people who wear uh, hearing aids did much better. So I always send them uh, to go and get evaluated by an audiologist and uh, get the appropriate treatment. Next, lead, next slide, please. So here's one of the biggest uh, recommendations. So physical exercise, this has plenty of evidence to benefit dementia to prevent dementia and people who are in early stages to kind of slow down the decline, there is a lot of evidence. It also has a lot of other health benefits, such as reducing falls, maintaining mobility and independence. Uh, and it also has good impact on chronic conditions like depression, diabetes, high blood pressure. I also talk about the impact on the sleep. So people, um, you know, as we grow older, we tend to sleep less and more superficial and the deep sleep is lost as we grow older. So having good amount of exercise can benefit in a lot of different fronts, just not uh, the cognition. And here's another study I'm gonna pull in. Uh, so this was a Hunt study. They, so this is a relatively younger population they took and saw how things, you know, uh, what is the benefit of physical exercise. So these were people in 30 to 60 years of life. They followed them over 25 years. Uh, and people who had at least a weekly uh, midlife, moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity were, had a reduced risk of dementia. So um, why I think um, we, this is a good point to kind of reflect on what is a risk factor. Risk factor is something that puts you at a higher risk or a lower risk, but it doesn't guarantee you. So people who did all these physical exercises say, oh, you'll never get dementia. That's not the case. Or people who never had exercise will definitely get dementia. So that's not the, uh, uh, that's not the truth. It just uh, increases or decreases your risk. Next slide, please. 
So here are the federal guidelines, and uh, this is from a lot of different agencies, so I put it together. So 30 minutes a day or and five days a week, or a total of 150 minutes of a week of moderate intensity activity, or 75 minutes a, a week of vigorous intense uh, aerobic exercises. So when we say moderate intensity, uh, it's where you're, you're breaking a sweat and you're, you're having a little bit of sharpness of breath when you're uh, doing that activity. And uh, these should, if they cannot be like five minutes, two minutes, and then you do that 15 times a day, it should be at least 10 minutes. Uh, and on the other side, it cannot be you work out for two hours on one day and then the rest of the week you're not going to do anything. And this last point is so important uh, in, you know, as you grow older, your risk of having arthritis and other physical limitations can come in. And that should not discourage you from, oh, I am not able to do this moderate intensity, all these things that uh, are recommended, so I might as well quit. You should do as much as you can, you, you are able to do. And the other thing I always recommend is also, you know, I, I encourage people to go on walks all the time. So make sure that you're safe. You're not falling and you're not walking in a bad part of the neighborhood. But um, as long as you're able to do that, you promote it as much as you can. Next slide, please. So here's the second thing that has the highest evidence. So this is cognitive stimulation. This is keeping your brain active. And you know, I'm going to give you some uh, studies which use like structured activities, um, like this active trial that it took about six, uh, you know, healthy adults, 65 years and older. They participated in 10 sessions or five to six weeks. And uh, they, the, the study found that people who did those, uh, those activities had a higher performance and uh, improved on mental skills in that area, but it did not translate in other areas. What that means is if there was a, a task in memory, they did really good in having memory, but they probably didn't do a great uh, improvement in attention. And this improvement but persisted for years after the training. So, um, these are like very structured things that they use in research studies, but the things that I uh, recommend are like Sudoku, crosswords, um, word searches, anything that keeps your brain uh, engaged and uh, that you find interesting and not necessarily, uh, and it should not be frustrating to you. Uh, that can go south pretty quickly. Um, and the other thing is to learn something new, you know, trying to learn a new language or, you know, a, before COVID, I would encourage people to go learn dancing or singing. Those are really great skills to uh, help build new circuits in the brain and uh, improve the resilience. Um, so a, a lot of other observational studies, you know, people just have observed over time, have seen that reading or playing games may lower the risk of uh, Alzheimer's related cognitive impairments. Next slide, please. So we are just going down uh, about the recommendations. So diet doesn't have the uh, same uh, level of evidence as we saw with physical activity and cognitive stimulation, uh, but it still uh, has enough to recommend the Mediterranean diet or the close related mind diet, um, which is heavy on vegetables, fruits, um, nuts, and uh, a lot of uh, white meat and less of red meat. So the way we believe that this works and we don't know for sure is that uh, the oxidative stress, that the antioxidants in this diet, uh, you know, uh, help the inflammation and the underlying Alzheimer's. But it also could be uh, helping the other risk factors like di diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Next slide, please. So I'm going to briefly talk about this because this often comes up in my visits when people have had a head injury. So a head injury can be mild where they've had a concussion or they can be severe where they have had skull fractures, edema, bleeds, and injuries to the brain. Um, and we've noticed that even a, small, a single severe, that's the one with the skull fracture and severe uh, cases, it can lead to changes kind of similar to what we see with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, people with TBI or traumatic brain injury, when we follow them up for 10 years, uh, still have a higher risk of uh, having dementia. And the highest is in the six months after the TBI. 
So one Swedish study found that it kind of went down after 30 years. So if you've had like a, a brain injury in your high school, the risk may not be that much when you're in your 60s and 70s. Next slide, please. So here is one place where we've done really good, I think, as a health system that, you know, we manage our uh, blood pressures. So in it, kind of similar things exist for diabetes also. So we'll just go over the uh, blood pressure findings. So these, uh, you know, there are a couple things like the SPRINT study and the uh, Farm uh, Framingham uh, off, uh, offspring cohort. Both of them kind of showed that, you know, hypertension can cause increased risk of cognitive impairment. Um, so when people were stopped on taking the medications early because they shot in the sprint study, they stopped the medications because they were actually studying the cardiovascular uh, effects and they were pretty convinced that the, you know, controlling the blood pressure had such a good impact on heart, they stopped them. But then they followed these people over many years, uh, two years, and they uh, saw what is the risk of dementia the dementia did not change, but what we call as mild cognitive impairment, the risk went down uh, when people had a good uh, control of their blood pressure. And mild cognitive impairment is a risk for dementia eventually. Next slide, please. So uh, why diagnose? Um, so first of all, uh, I have to say it has been disappointing for many decades that we have not had a medication to change the course of illness. We don't have what we call as disease modifying agents. We are working uh, strenuously, and I think Banner Alzheimer's Institute has been um, on the forefront of doing this. Uh, but we don't have a medication which can slow down the decline significantly or stop the progression of the disease or reverse it. Uh, but there are some medications which can improve the cognition, which can boost the, uh, their memory and performance to some extent. and bend that curve a little bit favorably for the decline. So uh, having a diagnosis is really important and it's unfortunate that uh, a majority of the patients, like 40 to 50% of the people who have dementia may never get the diagnosis and hence they don't ever get the treatment. So it's, uh, it's important to diagnose and uh, treat. And more than anything else, it's a, it's a huge, uh, is, burden for the family to go over this uh, illness by themselves. And we see this over and over again. We want to support the families in this journey. And that's why it is important to diagnose and uh, provide appropriate resources. And also it is important to diagnose early so that you can kind of take care of the medical legal piece of it. And uh, I know there are a lot of other speakers here much better to speak about this than I am. But uh, let's say if someone is all, so we see sometimes patients coming in in their moderate stages of the disease, and then uh, they don't have a financial power of attorney and all those things, then you have to go to the court and it just makes things messy. So it's better to kind of put things in order and uh, be prepared uh, earlier than later. And also, so this is probably the biggest pitch I'm gonna make uh, to this group is, as you, as we said, we are trying to um, find an agent which can alter the course of the illness, and uh, we are doing multiple studies, and we have uh, plenty of studies in uh, Phoenix at Banner Alzheimer's Institute, and the majority of the studies don't do well because we don't have enough volunteers. Um, and sometimes it is people with illness, and sometimes it's people who don't have any symptoms, and we are always looking for volunteers and it is important for us to uh, you know, st study these medications and see what works. And that's going to be the path for us to uh, change the course of this trajectory. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide, uh, and this is no order of preference. I would actually reverse the order, but the order here is the place where people get their care most. So if you don't have uh, an access to a dementia specialist, uh, which is not the case in uh, Phoenix. Uh, most of the people uh, are, uh, the majority of dementia is taken care by primary care physicians. So that would be the first contact. If you're having any concerns of any dementia or memory loss or uh, anything that doesn't seem right, that would be our, your first contact uh, oftentimes. 
uh, the community neurologists see a fair amount of patients and they often refer them to us for either participating in clinical trials or taking care of the patients further. And at Banner Alzheimer's Institute, we are a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary group of practitioners. Um, we have physicians, nurse practitioners, and social workers, and we specialize only in taking care of dementia, and particularly Alzheimer's disease. And like I said earlier, we do a lot of research too. So uh, we are always uh, also uh, open to have uh, people come in and uh, you can contact our clinic and uh, we, uh, ex we send out a packet for you to fill out. And it is a pretty extensive packet, uh, but we, it gives us really valuable information to understand what is going on. Then we get that information and then prepare for our first visit. And, um, I think uh, I am proud to say we do an exceptional job in uh, taking care of our patients. So again, thank you for listening and I'm, I'm done with my slide deck. Thank you, Dr. G. Um, I, you know, I'm always so encouraged to see that really we're learning that there is evidence on uh, preventing well. Uh, certainly there is not 100%, but I think it gives encouragement for many of us who are caring for family members and are, we're concerned of ourselves and other families about risk of dementia in the future. And I think that um, in addition to clinical trials that are taking place, this idea that maybe lifestyle can make a difference uh, is, is very encouraging and the science is, is now backing that. So uh, I'm gonna remind participants again, we welcome your questions or comments and uh, in order to provide them, there is a, on um, the scroll bar, if you go across the mid screen, you'll see what looks to be a thought bubble with two lines through it. If you click on that, you're able to type in any questions you might have and we'll be coming back to them uh, after our panelists uh, finish their comments. Now we're gonna move on to uh, diagnosis has been made and how important it is to support the care partners who will walk through this process with their loved one. And again, joining us will be Susie Favaro followed by Carmen. So Susie, will you begin your discussion, please? Yes, good morning. I am so pleased to be here and thank you for asking me to come. Um, I've had the honor of attending several of these summits, and I have to say it's, it's always a highlight. It's just like an environment where you wish the whole world was, where the, the acceptance and the comfort level and of dementia friendly just seeps through. So, so thanks so much. And I'm going to be sharing, Carmen and I are going to be sharing um, some thoughts and ideas about supporting well. And for me, that, that equals self-management of chronic conditions. And all that self-management of chronic conditions means is learning to cope with and manage the emotional and practical issues um, that dementia presents. Now, believe it or not, this doesn't happen naturally. And, and I think Cindy and Susie, you talked about that very eloquently. The first step in this is to decide to actively engage in the care and management of dementia. You decide to factor this diagnosis into your life, but not allow it to be the only focus of your life. And you decide not to hold on to who the person was, but instead appreciate who the person is now. Now, amazingly, there can be unexpected gifts in this. And I just wanna share uh, one example of a of a woman that I was working with who had dementia. Um, she had a son that she had never had the relationship she really wanted with him. And it wasn't until after her diagnosis that that relationship changed dramatically, that they, he really stepped up and she was so thrilled and amazed that she never had wished to have dementia. But if it brought this relationship, that was a gift that she hadn't expected. Um, four components of managing the condition. Uh, first is, is, well, the first one is managing the condition. And as a care partner, you take responsibility for your personal well being, getting your needs met, maintaining activities and relationships that are meaningful while you are providing care. 
And I think this is real important because sometimes we don't think of it, the caregivers don't think of it as both and, and it really needs to be that. Caring for yourself and caring for your person. Managing the condition also demands realistic expectations that you learn about your person's medical needs, the condition, and you're realistic about what that person can do and what you can do, and you don't try to do the impossible. You focus on what you can do with a clear, clear picture of what can be and what cannot be changed. And you wanna let go of those things that we can't change and seek solutions to the things that can. And then lastly about managing the condition is, is really communicating effectively with others. Don't assume that family or friends know what you need. It's important that you tell them and let them know and invite them, it would, it, accept their invitations if they, if they offer to help. The second component is carrying out normal roles and activities. Habits and routines uh, really provide comfort. And a routine that incorporates what Dr. G was talking about, social interaction with peers, physical activity, and cognitive stimulating activity is, is really helpful. You want to have a, a routine that you follow during the day where many tasks happen in a certain order, which seems to be the most helpful. In addition to that, you want to learn the needs of your person toward reducing stress and avoiding over demand. So that has to do with avoiding fatigue. The, the person is working a little bit harder to accomplish activities, their brain is working a little bit harder. So if there's a way that you can incorporate a, a rest break during the day, Day, that can be very helpful. And you can get to know the, their best time of the day for personal care, shower, you know, taking a shower, necessary chores and appointments, as well as fun things to do. Along with this, you want to keep the person active. Activities and purpose define who we are. So the goal is to allow your person to keep their abilities and strengths by doing a couple of things. You continue to do familiar things around the house because that's part of you know our everyday life and, and provides purpose and meaning which is also so important getting outside getting physical activity and continue favorite activities and crafts but adapt them as ne needed social activities with friends and families and, and as dr g said that's become increasingly difficult with the pandemic but there are some opportunities for virtual um, programming and whole Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to get back to the senior centers and the adult day programs. Um, the third component is managing the emotional changes. And as you all know, caring for someone with dementia can cause stress, overwhelm, and a unique kind of grief that was coined by Dr. Pauline Voss. It's called, and it, it happens when a person is physically present, but psychologically changed or absent from how they had been previously, which happens with dementia. An ambiguous loss is defined as a loss that is unclear, there's no resolution, and there's no closure. The ambiguity, the uncertainty coupled with that loss creates a powerful barrier to both coping and grieving. So some strategies to manage this kind of loss is to make a conscious decision to be okay with the uncertainty, to be okay with unanswered questions or problems that can't be fixed. You control the things that you can control. Acknowledge your sadness and your grief as it comes along the way. Ask for and accept help, and this is so important. If you don't have the support that you need, and it's maybe not coming from the family, which is not unusual at times, um, you need to create a psychological family, people that love you, that want to help, and become the people that have your back. Live in the moment, but allow yourself to dream and hope for present and future goals and possibilities. And most importantly, too, is to give yourself permission to take care of yourself while you are caring for your loved one. And a way to do that, we get to uh, setting goals and working towards them. And I wanna share with you the next slide, please. 
what is called an action plan. And an action plan is something that you want to do that is realistic, is behavior specific, and it answers the following questions. And I'm, this is just a brief example, and I'm going to turn it over to um, Carmen, who might have a few words about this as well. But the first question is what you're going to do. So let's say you want to um, address your stress. So you, you come up with a solution of, OK, I, I, I'm going to practice mindfulness to, to, to do this. How much you're going to do? You're going to do it for 10 minutes twice a day. When you're going to do it, first thing in the morning, before my husband wakes up and before I go to bed. And the when is real important because what happens sometimes is we all know we have a plan to do something the next day, but we don't schedule it into our life. And then it just kind of falls away because other things come up. So making that step is important. How often you're going to do it, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You don't want to schedule seven days a week because you need some wiggle room. Things come up and life can get in the way. So you want to be able to um, accomplish what your what your goal is here. And then you, you literally um, score your confidence level from zero to 10. Zero would be, oh, I don't think, I'm not going to be able to do this. Or 10 is, I know I can get this accomplished during the week. And if it's less than seven, you may want to tweak it. So if, this, if the confidence level here of this person was maybe five, an example might be, well, maybe I'll just commit the, for two days. You can always overachieve. So I'd like to turn it over to Carmen with some real life, uh, her real life experience here as a caregiver. Thank you. Hello, Hello. I'm Carmen. I've been married to Carl for 49 years now, and he is a man living with dementia. His uh, journey started probably around 09 when he started having difficulty controlling finances, and I took it over without us even talking about it or even thinking what was going on. By uh, 2011, he was having difficulty not only with memory, but also in making people understand what he was trying to say. There's a lot of um, difficulty communicating. And then in 2014, I took him to a doctor. He was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. We followed that for a while, but he was progressively getting worse. And he was eventually diagnosed positively with dementia, Alzheimer's type. And that was in 2016, which is the very same time that the Memory Cafe began to advertise. And here I am in Maricopa, and it was up in Tempe, but I decided to go see what the Memory Cafe was all about. And it turned out to be the most uh, wonderful thing I could ever have done to learn more and more about this dementia, what it was all about, and um, to accept those things that I cannot change and to make the best um, life possible for myself and for Carl. I will always appreciate it. Um, Carl is right now in late stage. I can't do things with him like I used to do. I used to make him have a an activity of some kind every day, and, and it's just simply not possible. Um, communication is almost nothing. He can repeat things. I think that's called echolalia. So I say, good morning. He can say, good morning. And I say, um, uh, I love you. And he says, I love you. But he cannot initiate anything on his own. So it's really um, quite late in the stage now. He is in hospice care at home. One of the things I learned at the Memory Cafe is that more often than not, the caregiver dies before the one who is receiving the care. And we all kind of learned that the hard way when one of our members had a stroke and another member died of a heart attack suddenly. And there have been others since then. So we have all been encouraging each other to try very hard to care for ourselves. And uh, the action plan that Susie has mentioned is one that I've recently taken a look at. There are three things that I could identify clearly for myself uh, one is to work out online with uh, silver sneakers. You know, I used to be very involved with silver sneakers at the gym, and Carl was going to daycare. Well, now both the gym and daycare are closed. It is online. Uh, they have a 48-minute workout that I especially like because it's similar to what we used to do in the gym. I can do that while Carl is sleeping because he's at the point now in his dementia where he's sleeping about 18 hours out of 24, so I just pick the nap. And my goal is to do it four times a week, 
And I, I think I'm going to do that and be able to follow through on it. Um, I also need to accept respite care. In uh, September, all three of my kids called me in the same week and told me I needed a break. And of course, that's a lot easier said than done. It was very difficult for me to ever turn the care of Carl over to somebody else, even for three or four hours, let alone actually taking respite. But I talked to my PCP about it. She said, you definitely need it. The next day I talked to his hospice nurse who said, yes, hospice will provide it. So I said, okay, 24 hours. And he said, no, it'll be five nights. And um, I did that. When I dropped him off, I felt guilty about it, but he actually did very, very well there. And um, I drove to Utah to see my brother. And that first night, I slept 10 hours. <laughs> That's something I haven't done in uh, decades, actually, and especially now that I'm up frequently at nighttime with Carl. So I realized I really did need it. And my daughter called the next day, and she said, oh, Mom, you sound so rested. So um, the interesting thing is when I picked up Carl, he did not have any clue that I'd been gone five days, completely did not know it. <laughs> so uh, in the future, I'm going to accept it as needed, um, you know, an hour at a time, four hours at a time. And as far as that five night respite that is offered, I fully intend to use it every five months or six months, definitely before somebody tells me how much I need it. And the other thing that I need to do is keep my own doctor appointments. Like most caregivers, I made sure that Carl got all of his appointments and then I neglected myself. I am right now uh, two months behind on my annual physical. I do have it rescheduled for next month. And so I am going to continue um, making this action plan of attending to my own needs. I will go as they're scheduled by the office, uh, I have to have a monthly blood draw, I'll do that, and I will uh, continue with the annual ones. As far as my confidence in myself, uh, meeting these goals, first of all, I have goals to, to care for my husband, and I have full confidence, I'm a number 10 there. Uh, confidence about following through on this action plan I just laid out, my confidence level is about an eight, so I think that's pretty good, a little room for improvement. But I, I think I'm okay. I have good support from hospice and I'm still in touch with friends from the Memory Cafe. And I have a few other friends that are always there saying if you ever need anything. So I will continue with my idea of having a good day every day and following through on the action plan. I hope this has been helpful. Wow, thank you both Susie and Carmen. And Carmen, um, you know, you represent the real deal. You are one of the reasons we uh, as a city are focused on dementia friendly efforts because we know it can be a long and arduous process. But I hope that each of you on this call today um, are as bold as Carmen in terms of creating an action plan for yourself because without you, the care that you desire to give the person you love just is it going to be possible? Well, thank you, uh, Susie and Carmen. And now we're going to, to turn uh, the corner a bit, and I'm going to ask for Carolyn Hutchins. I hope, I'm hoping that she joined us and did not have technical issues. And Excellent. And Anesthesia Johnstone to talk about the importance of living well with dementia during uncertain times. So now we're going to focus on the person who is living with dementia. So ladies, I'll let you uh, start with your comments. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about, you know, what happens after the diagnosis and now you're working with your person and how do you make the most of the time that you have with that person for as long as you choose. So we're going to talk about activities today and things that you can do to, to keep yourself engaged, to keep your person with with memory care, with memory issues engaged as well. Next slide, please. So the pandemic obviously gave us a whole lot of things that we had to do differently in a very short amount of time. We went from being with people and engaging people and hugging them and, you know, shaking hands and whatnot. And now we are completely isolated because of COVID-19. So we had to reimagine exactly how you do activities. So virtual programs became very popular all of a sudden, and you can find much like the caregiver spoke before, 
where she finds the silver sneakers activity, we have new activities that are available to anybody on any computer or a cell phone or any kind of a device that's, that's been ama amazingly helpful to help give activities in your home to your loved one. So the, the virtual activities that we've been able to produce as a community um, have been amazingly helpful to families so that they can share with a loved one or if a, a family member comes over, they can help do activities with their loved one. So families had to find a new way to stay connected as well. So how do they do this safely? All of a sudden we're seeing Google Hangouts and Microsoft Teams and, and everything that nobody's really thought about using before in their everyday life. And now all of a sudden that's becoming very popular. So you see birthday parties online and you know the connection is, is the most important part of the activities that we're providing is still connecting with that person with memory loss. So it's important to really find a way to get in touch with your family members. Even though they can't be there with you, you can still, you know, have a moment with them singing happy birthday, you know, on for, the holidays are coming up. So how is Thanksgiving going to work? How are, you know, holidays going to work? We have to look at things a little bit differently, but still give the most amount of care and support to the person with memory loss and the person caring for that person with memory loss. So we also had to figure out a new way to go shopping safely. Um, you know, you can't just walk into a store without a mask on and all of a sudden, if you have health concerns, you shouldn't be in a store. So how do you get anything done? You have to have things delivered to your house all of a sudden, which, you know, way back in the day, I know was a thing when the milkman would come and bring milk, but now all of a sudden, you're, you're buying all of your groceries online and you know they give you pictures and different things, but that's something that somebody has to learn. Uh, so there are different classes and different support systems to help people do that. Doctor visits are now being done over the phone or on a computer as well so that you can still stay connected with your, with your doctor um, for things that don't require a blood draw or something of that nature. But we had to reimagine everything in a very small space but still making sure that that person, that families that are caring with somebody with dementia, that their world didn't shrink as much as, you know, it, it appears to with COVID-19. They still have access to friends, family, doctors, activities, things that will keep them busy. Next slide, please. So the engagement part of um, Living Well right now is that Video activities um, have been incredibly popular as far as handing somebody a computer and they don't know how to get on a computer, but if it's already set up, all of a sudden there's pictures and there's colors and different things that will keep people engaged. Music and art have been an amazing success. I know that Oakwood does a fantastic art class that they provide to families who want to get together and they're doing the activity with other people on a computer, so you're still not alone but you're in the comfort of your own home, painting a picture with others who are in their own home, painting their pictures. Um, music therapy has been incredible as far as ASU, offering all kinds of music therapy classes and keeping people engaged. You know, music is, is incredibly important to helping somebody with memory loss to get through their day um, and to, it's, it's something that's familiar to them. So it's, it's incredibly important. Caregiver toolkits have been something that's new that are personally designed for families so that they can do an activity with their loved one at home. And it gives instructions on how to engage that person, whether it's painting a picture or sorting, you know, fixing something, doing something of that nature. Caregiver toolkits are, are somewhat new um, that I think a lot of the providers in the Valley are, are starting to help with so that all of their members can stay engaged with their loved one. And it helps the person form a connection with their person with dementia so that they are able to, um, so that they're able to uh, have a moment together and, and complete an activity together. Next slide, please. Activities. So movement is incredibly, I, I know that somebody said activities and purpose are, are what keep us 
engaged in our in our life during the day. So movement is, is incredibly important. So any of the activities that they provide online as far as exercise programs or a walking challenge or something of that nature, that's going to help, you know, with that person slow their progression a little bit as far as what how their anxiety pr processes throughout the day. So social interaction is is needed. We all still needed you know, people in our lives, even though we can't be with them every day, we still need to see them. We still need to be a part of something and we still need to accomplish something. So I think that the activities that are provided online are incredibly helpful with that. Next slide, please. Resources. Um, so while many people went very fast to try to produce activities for family members. I know at the adult day centers, we went from seeing everybody every day to the next day not having anybody and us still needing to reach out to our family members and to our members that attended the centers and members of the community. What we found is that we needed to provide resources. We couldn't just call and say, hey, how you doing? We had to give them some resources that were going to help them you know, keep their sanity during this, this crazy unprecedented time. So we had to not only design the program, the virtual programs, we also had to communicate with each other as far as what everybody was doing and sharing those ideas with, with the community so that we were all able to, you know, provide support. Um, the goal was to just make sure that people that were caring with their loved ones we're still able to do that at home if that's what they chose to do, but they needed support to be able to do that. So where you see, you know, the resources of virtual programs, telehealth visits, you know, toolkit deliveries, anything that, that we can do to help you in the community take care of your loved one is what is what is a community. That's that's what makes Tempe so special that we're able to do that and provide that service to everybody within the community. Next slide, please. All right, I'm going to turn it over. So Anastasia, um, we'd like to invite you to talk about um, how mm -hmm. you are choosing to live well uh, with your diagnosis and the kinds of things that you're doing that um, provide purpose and meaning in your life and carrying on. And I guess in some ways also fighting the stigma and the ideas we have about when we hear that somebody has dementia, we often want to minimize their ability. And so we would love to hear from you about, I think, what you are doing to live well. Well, thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Yes, I'll give you my thoughts and this is what's helped me. Um, good. Hello, everyone. Um, for me, my diagnosis, um, it happened um, four years ago and almost five years ago actually and um what i have chosen to do with my life because now i, I am no longer able to work i'm no longer in the workforce uh, i volunteer sometimes depending on what i needed weekly i take care of my parents um i have a son that's in first year freshman in college and what i do and i look at the silver lining of this diagnosis is with me having that diagnosis I was able to be home with my son while he became an Eagle Scout and his projects and Boy Scouts. It allowed me to be there every morning to make him breakfast, to take him to school. Uh, so I, because at that time when I had gotten sick, I was getting ready to go into the nursing program. And I knew if I, you know, my friend told me one time, if you'd become a nurse, he'd be working all holidays. He, he wouldn't be here. You would he'd miss all these events that, that you're able to be part of. She says, that's what you have to look at that and I seized that opportunity and I took that and and so I still have a schedule I, I still take my mom grocery shopping there are days when I can tell when my brain is tired and I I, I stay home base I stay home but um, I took a class that Susie offered at Banner Alzheimer's Institute which was very helpful in that um, ambiguous loss and learning the steps and having an action plan and that helped me that what I went ahead and did is I decided I was going to finish and get my college degree. And I did. I received my associate's degree this year. Of course, it came by mail because we couldn't graduate. And I remember going through this situation when I was trying to register and I had to do this. I had an individual say to me, not being rude, but she says, well, you look perfectly normal because I was requesting some um, assistance, some resources. 
And I looked at her and she looked at me. She's, I can't believe I said that. I says, I get that. I says, but you know, you don't know what you don't know. And you're assuming because I, I, you see my paperwork that I have this, that I don't know anything. I says, I'm very capable. I'm very willing. I says, and if I'm having issues, I will say I'm having issues, but don't assume because you're looking at my information that I don't have anything to give or that I'm not knowledgeable. I may not know what you know, but I do have stuff I can offer you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's helped me a lot. Um, I I keep I have a routine. I get up every. Right, put your socks and shoes on so we can get going. I have a routine. I I I'm take sorry. care of what my parents. You? I still. Winner in particular states. Uh, those votes are tallied by those on the ground reported through the Secretary of State. So I'm not sure what happened there. Anastasia, are you still with us? Somebody, oh, now can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, somebody must have unmuted, uh, must have muted me. <laughs> Um, what do you recall learning last? And then I can go from there. Uh, about the importance of you have a routine that you follow each day. Yes, I do. I have a routine. I actually have actually went ahead and had this routine, my morning routine and evening routine. I went and had it laminated and I have it in my bathroom, but it's a routine where I get up, make my bed, get dressed, go and make coffee for my mom and my dad, serve my, serve them and get start the morning, get it starting breakfast. My son is already up by then. And and I kind of just follow that day. Certain days I do my laundry. Mm -hmm. I make a point of having something to do. Um, I've just recently taken up sewing. So I'm going to try and sew. I haven't sewed in years. So it's kind of like pandemics. Like, okay, we're going to become creative. So I'm trying to do more be creative. Um, I listen to a lot of music, love music. I enjoy that. I, uh, I play a lot of online games through AARP, uh, which was the cognitive which helps me stay sharp. There's some of some of those games are really kind of twisters, but it, it, I like the challenge. I really do like the challenge. And I'm very mindful of the fact, you know, if I had the, the dream job that I really wanted, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to be home to take care of my mom and my dad and to help my son achieve what he was achieving because I would actually have to have somebody else help me where I'm actually able to do it. So I think that sometimes is one of the best gifts you can give people that you love that took care of you is that you're able to take care of them. And and I, and I try very hard to take care of myself. Um, I'm not saying sometimes we don't fall down on that, but I really try and improve what I have, my diagnosis. And I, and when it, there's times when I will actually tell people my diagnosis and the reaction is, is sometimes they're surprised. You know, I had one person tell me, well, you talk so well. And it's like, well, what did you expect? You know, and then I see the stigma where people assume, that, you know, you have dementia. Once they hear dementia, it's like, oh, you're old, you're, you know, I'm not old. I'm by no means old. You know, they think you're a grandma or you're this, and it's not that at all. They, they forget that we, you know, we were maybe an architect or a nurse or a stay-at-home mom or we ran our own companies, you know. We were all, we were all some somebody. We are all still that same person, maybe just a different facet of us because we're we have so many things to offer. And that's really what I would like for people to see with people with dementia is, that we're not just a single fast individual. We have many things to us. We're, you know, we're someone's best friend, we're someone's maybe girlfriend, maybe someone's wife, our husband or cousin, you know. So I think it's really important that we remind people, you know, that we have a lot of gifts to offer. And maybe we may not remember you, you know, that's my thing is I'm working on creating memories for my, for my son. So that when that day comes, when I can't remember things, and I have a picture to look at it. I'll remember the feeling. I'll remember the love. And I think that that's how I'm look. That's what I'm looking for, you know, and, and looking to, to make things better. You know, I want him to have good memories of me. So that's how I try and live well. Thank you, Anastasia. You know, and I'm reminded, um, first of all, your comments are so welcome. You too represent why this community is, is so incredibly important that we we best understand and respect and see the person first as a person and not the diagnosis. But it also reminds me of the work done by Dr. Boss where she talks about life with dementia can be less than perfect, but mm -hmm. still be pretty good. 
and the perceptual shift is is under your control. And this is where I think Anastasia, uh, both you and Carmen, I think are excellent examples of choosing to live well, choosing to find the silver lining, choosing to make a difference in, in your community. And I thank you for that. So we're going to keep uh, moving now. I, I hope you found um, that as important as, as certainly I, I did in terms of really understanding kind of this lived experience and the importance of doing the prevention kind of work that um, still we see anesthesia doing to live her best. But now we're going to move on and talk about uh, the uh, importance of planning well. And so I'm going to ask Elaine to join us now and uh, provide us her discussion. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this amazing team. Every single person touched upon something that is part of the plan B. So I love when it kind of works out that way. Um, the, the words I have on the screen here are choice equals power. I have a couple of mantras that I believe in and proactive being reactive is one of them. And so what I'm going to do um, as you listen to some of the items that I go through today is think about how you want it handled when. Because a lot of the, a lot of the bullet points that I'm going to go through can't be discussionary practices with your family, your circle, until you've really had that conversation with yourself and you've had a little bit of time to process some of the things that I'm going to think about or going to talk about and, and address. You know, if, if you think about yourself, are you somebody that does things proactively and you like to be prepared? Or are you somebody who kind of rolls with the punches and you sort of deal with the situation when it is at hand and, and there really is a situation? And so when you look at what are we needing a plan B for, you know, what, what are we really preparing for? I think that um, Dr. G put it well, um, you know, he said sometimes we hit the crisis and it makes the difference. But the crisis isn't always a big thing. A crisis isn't always a heart attack. It's not always a car accident. A crisis can be as small as a fall. Um, it can be as small as an infection that changes the course. Um, it, for a caregiver, a crisis could be that you fall before somebody else does. Um, uh, I forget, I think it was um, maybe Susie or Carolyn um, um, that mentioned Carmen, um, caregivers die before some, there's a 30% die before the people that they're caring for, but 60% of caregivers um, are more likely to get sick and have issues before the people that they are, you know, before the people that they're taking care of. And I think that's a staggering statistic. So for you, it, it, it could be you fell down, it could be you got a rough diagnosis and now you need therapy, you need, a, you know, you have a cast, you're not as physically capable, um, you need surgery, something's going on. Maybe your person with dementia had a significant change in what they did. Maybe they had a fall, they broke a wrist, maybe they got an infection or a UTI, which makes dementia looks like it escalates dramatically. Just some kind of a sudden unexpected change can make a difference. So if you would um, go to the next slide, please. I ask everybody, are you sharing what your reality is with all the people in your world? And I know that for people that attend the memory cafes regularly, this is a normal part of our discussion because as Dr. G and Susie and everybody else mentioned, we need a team. This is not something that we can tackle alone. But oftentimes we don't like to share our burdens with family members, with the people in our circle, because there are many reasons we don't want to share. One, we, we don't want to burden them. Two, we sometimes are scared on the inside that if we share that there's a crack, that there's something wrong, people are going to come in and try and tell us what to do. And um, we don't want to do that. We want to be able to forge our own journey here. So when we make a plan, we get to drive the bus. We get to be the voice that says how you want it handled. You want to click one more time, please. 
most of us see ourselves as really pretty infallible. Only about 50% of the people with dementia are aware of their dementia, but us as caregivers, you know, if I asked everybody in this room on a day when we're feeling good in good health, most of us feel about 10, 20, even maybe more years younger in our heads. We're still vital, we're still energetic, we're still fun, we still have these great ideas. But if you're struggling in your home and you're struggling with managing what your situation is, we need to share that. Um, the accepting help, the willingness to accept help. Carmen said that beautifully because again, we can't do that alone. And if we've got kids or people walking into our situation and what we presented to them is very different to what they see when they come to visit, that's a harsh reality. And when we get that sort of shock, our brain kind of freezes for a while. We don't think about what's next. We don't think comfortably and easily about what's happening next. So if we go to the next slide, please. So there are a couple different things about getting our ducks in a row, and I'm really gonna focus today on the first three, the legal, the practical, and sort of those executional options. From a legal perspective, um, Dr. G also managed, the earlier we get diagnosed or we see that there's a change, the better, because getting our legal ducks in a row are incredibly important, financial as well. Um, when is the last time you looked at your powers of attorney? And when is the last time you shared and talked openly with who those powers of attorney are about what your needs are, what may be expected of them, what may be needed from them, and are the people that you have appointed capable of doing that? Are they willing to do that? Has it been so long since you looked at those documents that they're not really you know, pertinent to where you are in your life right now? That's super important. People. In early stage dementia, as we know, they're perfectly fine, except when they're not, right? And those not periods come sporadically. But if you have long-standing relationships or your person is good in the mornings and starts to struggle a little bit in the afternoons or sleeps in the morning and they're bright between 12 and three, and you begin establishing a relationship or continuing a relationship with your professionals that help you they will work with you because they've known you and there's a history there. But even some of the, you know, you getting a new attorney, looking at things, were your documents written up in Arizona? Are, are, are they, no, uh, do the laws apply in Arizona or were they written up in Minnesota and or Iowa and you haven't lived there in quite a few years? Getting everything in order, durable power, of um, medical power of attorney, financial, um, who's going to come in and fill in those places when you no longer can make decisions? So there's there's a, a break there. They don't just get to take over. You have to not be able to do that anymore. Arizona is the only state that has mental health power of attorney, and that allows someone to put you in a level one behavioral hospital. Most of the time that comes into play for anyone who is somewhere along the mental health spectrum but it also comes into play with later stage dementia and Alzheimer's, especially when there are a lot of medications involved. Having those documents in order can save you lots of money and not needing to apply for guardianship for somebody if you have to begin to make decisions of that manner. So doing a check on that legal piece, looking at your finances and making sure that everything is in order so that if something happens unexpectedly, your money isn't tied up in probate and you have the money you need to be able to care um, for whoever needs that care, whoever needs that financial support. Um, it, you can even get your finances set up to save monies for people who are the healthy spouse and looking at getting those things in order appropriately because there is planning that's involved. And even with things like visit, um, with VA benefits, they now have um, a look back period where they never did before. People who worked during or who served during um, um, military times, Korean War, World War II, um, and certainly those are our older folks, but even certain areas of Vietnam, you can get veterans aid and attendance to help pay for care whether it be in the home or assisted living or memory care. So those are all options that need to be 
looked at um, ahead of time so that we can plan appropriately and the monies are there as we need them. Um, some of the practical ducks that we don't think about, um, do we keep a list of who our emergency contact is in our telephone, in our wallets? And oftentimes that emergency contact is our spouse. And the, if our spouse is somebody that's living with dementia, they may not be the best person anymore. We need a backup of a couple people um, to be able to support us when something happens. Things like medical alert buttons. We think, oh, I'm with my person who has dementia all the time. They don't need a medical alert button. But you as a caregiver may need a medical alert button because in a crisis situation, can your person call 911 for you and remember how to use the telephone and how to do that? I um, regularly meet with people that have are in that crisis situation where the person went with dementia went out looking for help in the neighborhood and then proceeded to get lost. And both parties then were in a rough situation. So simple things like that. And especially if we have any comorbidities, if we've got the high blood pressure, the epilepsy, the um, um, diabetes where we're blood sugar dependent and or heart issues, we need to have a backup in place. So looking at at those kinds of things. Do we keep copies of our medications in our wallet? Not only for ourselves, but for our loved ones as well, because that is the most important thing that's needed. If you get into an ER, they need to know what kind of medications you're on to be able to treat you appropriately. So keeping that list in your wallet updated with the date, this is me, this is my spouse, um, family members who take care of other people, you need that information as well. Even if our power of attorney lives in Boston or in Flagstaff, they should know the medications that we have. They should know if Medicare is our primary insurance or if we have an Advantage plan. Giving them copies of those documents so that they can help you in, um, you know, when you're in need. Looking at things like advanced directives. When is the last time you reviewed all that information? Um, many of us have it as part of a trust, and that's great, but if it's sitting in a book, it doesn't do us any good. We need to give that to the people involved in our care, including our doctors. And if we haven't looked at that material in a while, it's time to review it. We should re be reviewing that information every couple of years to make sure that things haven't changed. Because once you get a life-altering illness, something that changes it, a lot of times the decisions you made previously take on a new light and you choose to do things a little bit differently. But if you only have something written down from many years ago, it doesn't give your family, your loved ones, the people that help you, you know, to make decisions and follow through when you're in trouble. It doesn't give them the guidelines they need because I'll tell you, I've been working with families for 30 years. It's the day-to-day -day things that make, you know, that make all the difference. It's the day-to-day -day little decisions and details that create discord within the families because oftentimes we may have children that live here and children that live there. The children that live here are a little bit more tuned in just because we tend to see them a little bit more. So we may have had discussions with them that we haven't shared with the other ones not because we've not chosen to share them, but just because it hasn't come up. So you need to kind of get a plan. How do you want it handled? And then share that plan with your family. Oftentimes when families aren't dealing with illness of any variety, um, they, they don't want to talk about it. The kids say, we don't need to talk about this now. It's not important. I don't, I don't want to think about it. But they have to think about it, and you do too, because if you have a plan in, you know, in place, they see that you took care to do what you needed to do, and they will follow the instructions that you gave because you gave them a guideline to be able to do that. And you have a whole lot of less bickering in the family when you've outlined something for them to follow. So those are really some of the the biggest people, um, the biggest items that I, I really want to address. Even simple things like lining up 
your doctors and putting it on paper and who are they and what is their contact information and making sure when you go to every doctor, you update your contact info. And if your spouse is no longer your first point of contact, make sure you have a couple people. Your daughter in Kansas may be your power of attorney, but maybe your best friend or your neighbor next door is the person that goes to every appointment with you. Because when we're not feeling well, we need somebody to go to the doctor with us and be our advocate and be another set of eyes and ears. So these are just some of the basic pieces um, for you to think about it. And it gives you a, a way to you know, kind of start looking at what, what do you have in place? What do you need to consider a little bit differently? I do have a class that I will go over all of this in an hour on November 20th but um, we'll get to that in a sec. I'll have you move to the next slide, please. Looking at your reality, do you come to terms with where you are or are you still not really accepting everything that you have to accept? And that acceptance piece is very large. But if you look at first, is your situation safe? Are you comfortable? You are the main person taking care of somebody living with dementia. Who is it that falls into place when you can't be there? Somebody um, talked before, um, I forget exactly who, but all of us are human, but all of us play superheroes many hours in a day, many, many days in a week, every day, right? But we can't be that superhero 24 seven. We don't have the wherewithal, we don't have the energy. So we need to create that team and figure out what we need to do to have everything lined up to be the support system that we need. And then when we share it with our family, if they won't listen and they're not willing to do that and that will happen, write it all down. Write it all down, have somebody witness it and have it notarized because then you can hand it to everyone in your circle and everyone is on the same page and knows that this is your wish, this is how you want it done. So um, if you wanna just go to the last slide, I think my time's up here. Um, but if you want to have any questions or get more details with, I've got charts and plans and lists and everything, join us. It's a free virtual class on Friday, November 20th. And I invite everybody to share it with whoever would like to join in. Thank you, Elaine. Yes, and I hope uh, for those who haven't really thought through a plan B that you will join uh, Elaine into a deeper dive because certainly, you know, we the reality is we should all have a plan B because life happens when we least suspect it. Well, thank you to each of our panel members. And, you know, I as as I listened in on, on such rich content, you know, I'm, I'm reminded that this wellness paradigm is actually a loop, a continuous loop where we move from preventing to supporting to living with to planning for and that it's not static. It, 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 it's uh, constantly changing and requires that um, as a person living with dementia, as a care partner, that we're constantly having to kind of go into modes of caring for ourselves, caring for a person, figuring out what we need next, and, and that's constantly changing. So I'd like to begin to, um, I guess this discussion, and, and this is where I'm gonna ask our speakers if they would go ahead and turn their cameras off so people can see you live, see your beautiful faces. And maybe, let me start, Dr. G, um, you know, especially as we're going now into the holiday season, um, and now we've got COVID in the midst of all of this, you know, what advice would you give uh, while you're sitting around the family table or maybe having conversations with family members, either on, um, you know, helping the person live their best with a diagnosis or what they could do to ensure that they're getting the best medical care that they need? Yeah, thank you, Janet. Um, so I think uh, given the context of the pandemic, we got to start with the safety precautions. You know, we got to make sure that we are going to be safe and take the appropriate precautions with uh, uh, limiting the amount of you know, transmission that could happen. So given that, I think it underscores the importance of, you know, having that socialization and uh, having that interactions with the family, which is really important. 
And it is also uh, key that uh, we kind of engage in the healthy diet practices that we talked about. It's often the time that we may slip up a little bit and we need to keep ourselves accountable for those, uh, the dietary practices and physical exercise too. It's also easy to kind of scale back and say, okay, well, I'm gonna take a break. So continue to doing those practices. Um, and uh, so the holiday times, you know, on the other side of this spectrum of the disease is this oftentimes the times people, uh, the family can come across these uh, really glaring uh, deficits that the family members may have. You know, often, like uh, mother used to put out the dinner so eloquently all these years and now she's not able to do it. And the family comes to realization as to how bad the problem has become. So, um, so this is oftentimes a realization and a time of panic, uh, and it's a good time for us to kind of reassess where the situation is, and uh, just like how all of our panelists talked about, uh, come up with a plan B and come up with all these things that we need to do. Thank you. And so maybe Carmen and Susie, I would love, uh, Susie Favaro, I'd love for you to address kind of around the family table or around uh, telephone conversations, maybe what what should caregivers communicate to family members or think about asking for, um, for their own support and well-being? And you'll have to unmute Carmen and Susie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think it's important for those who haven't seen us for a while because we have been social distancing even from family. I think it's important for them to know uh, how much Carl has declined from the last time they signed. We keep in touch all the time with text and email and telephone and so forth. But um, when they come to see him, I don't want them absolutely shocked, which has ha happened a couple of times already this year. So I think it's really important for us to let them know the condition of the person before they come. So it's almost like Elaine was saying, um, kind of sharing your reality because they probably have a very different reality of mm -hmm. what the situation is and you know how how dad or brother or whatever might have been in the past. Now it's it's very different. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, Susie, yeah. you were you're going to say something? Yeah, I totally agree with Carmen. And another way I think about it is if if the situation was reversed. What so let's say let's say a, a daughter or a son, you know, had a situation in their life. How much would you want to know about that? You would want to know the details of that. And so if you can think, sometimes I think caregivers hold back because they don't want to burden their family. But in fact, by not sharing the truth, that becomes more of a burden. Mm -hmm. And so I. I encourage people to, to consider that um, maybe as a motivation to, like Carmen said, to be, to be honest and, and, and along with that, let them know how they can help. You can't mm -hmm. do too much of that. Nobody, no caregiver comes in and says, I got too much help too soon. No, <laughs> nobody says that. Right, and it seems like uh, maybe Elaine during the holidays, this is a, a good time too to, to remind family or friends, by the way, you're my backup decision maker, right? Because life can happen suddenly. And so how does one have that uh, discussion over turkey? <laughs> because for many people, it makes them want to choke. <laughs> Un unmute, please, Elaine. Sorry, Tadja. Um, so. So depending on your, you know, if you've got a huge group of people there, I don't recommend doing it with all the, the big group of people. But typically, if we've got family coming, we, you know, get together a little bit more intimate of a group and say, hey, this is kind of what's going on. These are the kinds of things I've been talking about or even share with them. Could you, could you, you know, put aside a couple hours. I'd like to talk to you about just a couple of things about what's going on, some of the things that I'm working on. Some of the things I'd like to share to you as things change. I kind of want to get a little plan in place in case something happens to me. You know, just give them a heads up, kind of that warm engagement. And, and then the other thing I think that's really important for families when you do that is put it on you versus on them. Like these are the kinds of things that are important to me to get together 
I'd really value your opinion on these things. Um, I'd really value your input. I want to be able to kind of process everybody's thoughts. I, I, I would like to share some of the things that I'm thinking about. And I would like this to be a family discussion or just the opposite. I'm not so sure I'm ready for everybody's input yet, but I'm starting to process these things myself. Mm -hmm. So kind of get ready for that because I'm going to put some things out there. Mm -hmm. Yada, yada. You know, you know your people. You know how they respond. You know how they react. And you can give them a little piece. But just set aside a quiet time with the smaller group that you need to be able to do. And then get your thoughts on paper before you get there so that you can kind of go through a checklist to make it comfortable for you. Hi, Jan. This is Mary. Yeah. We did have a couple questions in our yes, chat I, box. I, and and I'm going to get to those, so just okay. know I'm going to get to those. Let me just finish this portion. And so Anastasia and Caroline, uh, I, I, Caroline, I'd love to hear from you kind of around these family conversations or holiday greetings about the living well and perhaps how we can ask to, um, for assistance to stay engaged. So thoughts you might have. For me, um, for living well, I, like I, I believe Elaine had talked about getting your affairs in order. I've done that already. Um, so I've had people in place in my tribe, so to speak, uh, that I've already given the documents to, so they have them. So in case that situation arise, it's all taken care of. And so, and basically that my son is taken care of, that's the most important fact for me. Um, and it takes that burden off my parents. So, you know, I mean, you you know, didn't know this was going to be my life, how this was going to happen, but in a lot of ways, it's given me a lot of peace. I mean, I know when I started bringing it up, people were I don't want to say freaked out, but they were kind of like, oh, we don't like, do we have to talk about this? And, but I've got I, the people that I have told and I've opened up to, and I said, you're on my list. You're, this is where things happen. And when I explained to them why I was doing it and I explained, well, I'm doing it for the benefit of my son, because I don't want, I says a young man to be having to make all these decisions is not, is not fair to him. And I, I says, and when I took it from that perspective, when I was trying to explain to them why I was doing it, and these were my wishes, they were very open to it and very accepting of it. And it's, it's been very, it's been, a, it took a lot off me personally. So that's helped me feel better about it. Um, I know what the outcome is going to be and I'm okay with that. But in the meantime, I'm going to, I'm going to live well. I'm going to do the best I can and be productive and take my medications, go to my appointments because I have to do that for me, but I also need to do it for my son and my family. And I stay engaged. I, we do uh, the Zoom, we try to sew. I would love to learn to roller skate, but we'll see how that goes. But um, no, I, I really am appreciative of Dementia Friends Tempe because they've offered a lot of insights. The Alzheimer's Association of Arizona has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of good resources out there. And I would definitely, if you're not sure you understand something, keep asking, ask. Excellent. And Excellent. eventually someone will ask, answer your yeah. question. And Carolyn Hutchins, might might you have some words of wisdom, and then we're going to move on to our next couple of questions. Um, I do actually. So when families are coming together, you know, for the holidays, and all of a sudden, you know, you you have a group of people there, and all of a sudden they want to engage in activities, but they don't know how. I think that it's important for families to help make that plan for their loved one to help them sh access things online or you know, bring activities with them or, or come up with some kind of a plan to stay engaged, not only with, you know, the person taking care of them, but with an entire community. So I think that if we can help somebody access these, these you know, amazing opportunities, that they're going to stay engaged and that's going to help, you know, with their their well-being and their caregivers' well-being. And, and I think it's just beneficial for the community. So I think that what we face early on when we brought out virtual programming was, yes, I know how to access virtual programming and design virtual programming, but my family members had no idea how to access virtual programming. So we had to make that easier and accessible for them to be able to do that. So I think as a community, if we can remember that, you know, I know that when my, my mom tries to access something on her phone and she can't do it right away, I just sometimes it's like, can I just do this? Because, you know, we just do things. Um, I think it's important to help families learn the, these sort of things so that they can stay engaged and they can choose the activities that, that have meaning to them. Excellent. Thank you. So we have a question from one of our participants. You know, unfortunately, not every family situation is ideal. And we know that people 
who have memory and thinking problems certainly are at risk for especially things like exploitation, especially during, uh, you know, the early stages. And let's face it, uh, where the telemarketers are like sharks. And so one of the questions is, um, you know, at Dr. G and Susie and then uh, Elaine, I know you can weigh in as well, is what's Banner doing in terms of are you working at all with um, on this issue of elder exploitation and what do you do? Do you get involved with law enforcement or how do you move forward uh, in, in these situations where you suspect or is being reported to you potentially that a person is being financially exploited or, or, or even abused or neglected? So Susie or Dr. G or, or yeah. Elaine, I'm going to let you all weigh in. I'll, I'll start. Um, well, we have an advantage here at Banner that um, <clears throat> I get to, or the social workers get to meet with most every patient. And so we do a, a, a you know, a first time assessment. And that's certainly one of the questions, but we see people regularly on a several months at a time. And um, that's an opportunity to be able to um, ask those questions and then be able to respond appropriately. And yes, and we certainly occasionally work with APS or, or services around those issues if that's if that's the case. Dr. G, did you have some comments? Yes, I will add that, you know, uh, Susie and the rest of our FCS uh, are really always with their antennas up for any of these abuses uh, happening. But we also, like all clinicians, we're always looking for cues or uh, things that uh, make us kind of uh, alerted to any of these abuse. And at this time, we uh, rely heavily on the uh, reporting it to the hotline and uh, in all in the law enforcement. And I'll also extend uh, that uh, we, this even extends to the research participants. Like when we see people in the research clinical trial and there is something odd, you know, some injury that doesn't make sense, we, you know, take those steps right away. We don't, uh, you know, say, oh, let's deal with this at the clinic or, uh, referred to somewhere else. So uh, we are all trained to be kind of looking out for these things. Excellent. Well, Lane, and final thoughts from you maybe in that? Well, I, if we look at it from the visiting angels perspective, when we get um, people that we're talking to, whether they're clients or whether they're not, and we're looking at their big picture of things, we make sure that there's a circle, that they're not alone. We don't deal with anybody individually or alone. We always try to have a family member, a representative, a friend, somebody there, we, you know, because, and, and then if we find somebody who really is alone, we work in place to get a triangle in place for them. So whether it's an advocate, whether it's an attorney or a financial person or a, a fiduciary, um, a geriatric care manager, somebody that comes in that can help to, you know, bringing in if they have a family member, but they're far away, we kind of get a, a, a triangle so that they're not in that place. We certainly call UP, or yes, APS when appropriate. And um, and even certain things, if we see um, industry of some variety, we also report to the attorney general's office just so that, you know, there is an awareness that, that chain. But we look to get just that circle around them so that they can't, so that there's somebody always watching them and and they're not in that really vulnerable position. Excellent, thank you. So now we have a more of a scientific question. I guess this will be for you, Dr. G, but then I'm curious to hear from the panelists. So um, we know that, that there's more work in terms of biomarkers. So we have a, a person from our audience asking, be, beyond the AP, APOE4 uh, allele, what other genetic markers um, are scientists looking at and um, are they important and then I'll ask to uh, maybe Anastasia and Carmen um, as a care partner and a person living with dementia what does this mean to you so Dr. G let's start with you okay thank you Jen um, so first of all let's make a distinction here so genetic markers are you know uh, what we're looking for are alleles and uh, to be moving to more specifics like uh, single nucleotide peptides so those are like the genetic makeup of uh, a person. And then there is biomarkers, which you know may, can include genetics, but can also include uh, things that would, in, uh, would denote like a neuroinflammation or neurodegeneration, the depth of uh, cells in the brain. So with respect to the uh, genes, APOE4 is the most prominent uh, allele that we are associating with late onset Alzheimer's disease. 
with early onset Alzheimer's disease, it's, it's the number of people who are developing uh, AD before the age of 65, and oftentimes it's even earlier. Uh, there are some really significant genes that can uh, almost guarantee that the person is going to have Alzheimer's. But at in the late onset, uh, it is ApoE4, which is the most predominant. But there's a lot of other what we call as gene uh, association studies, which have identified other um, genes. And I, I just have to say CLU. Uh, and we had uh, Dr. Ryman also identified one in 2007, GAB2. So there's a lot of different genes, but uh, the strongest amount of evidence of association is with ApoE4. I would add uh, that with the biomarkers, you know, the broader term, we are in a really exciting phase that we may have a blood-based biomarker. That's been the holy grail for AD research uh, to find a blood test where we can predict if a person has Alzheimer's disease. And we are very close to that. Uh, if, you know, in a probably a year or a couple of years, we should be having that. That would be revolutionary that we are able to do a blood test and say if someone has Alzheimer's disease or not. So that includes a lot of markers to say that there is brain cell death and uh, also to uh, identify amyloid and tau proteins in the blood, uh, which are proxy measures of amyloid and tau in the brain. Great. So Carmen and Anastasia, you know, you, you live this uh, every single day. Let me just ask of the two of you, what, what do these things mean to you, if anything? Well, I, I love the fact that all this research is still going on. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be done in time to help my husband, but I'm concerned about my children. I have every reason to believe that Carl's is genetic because his mother died with dementia. His older sister is in a nursing home right now with dementia at about the same stage as his. He had an older brother that died in July of 2019 with dementia. So I think it's genetic. Mm -hmm. I called my son in uh, Denver one day and I asked him, would you like to know, I can have a, a blood test done, see whether or not your dad has this. And he said, uh, no. So I called my son who lives here in Maricopa and I asked him the same question. And he said, uh, no. I said, boy, I know who taught you how to talk, you know. Um, they don't want to know. I do want to know because I'm concerned about the future generations. And I don't know, Dr. G, whether or not there's anything that they're doing, uh, sort of like what they're doing with sickle cell anemia, that, where they can take the cells from the body and do a genetic change so that when they uh, multiply the change that they've made on their own genetic makeup, they can uh, put it back into the body and it actually changes and it actually cures sickle cell. Is there anything like that going on for the APOE4? And we've got about two minutes left, so we'll have to wrap this up quickly. Okay. So quickly, I'm not uh, completely aware of all the things that uh, is with gene manipulation um, techniques, but uh, it's kind of challenging. It's uh, uh, CNS-related genes that we're talking about. And again, I want to uh, just emphasize that APOE4 is a risk gene, which means that it increases your risk, doesn't guarantee you that you have Alzheimer's disease in the future. And Anastasia, just quickly, what what do these genetic markers mean to you? I know you don't have Alzheimer's disease; you have a different form. But does, what does that mean to you? To me, it to me it means a lot because it's showing that we're they're still striving and testing and experimenting, and trying to find out what is what the possibility is. And, it, and personally, for me, I would want to know. I would want to know because then I could start maybe adapting my lifestyle. Maybe like, there's things I could do that could keep it at bay. And I would want to have any tool I could use to my benefit that would help me have a longer life, a more productive life. And even if I, like I already know my outcome, I'm still not gonna stop doing what I'm doing because I, I, I'm, I'm worth, I have value and it, and it matters to me because what I do is gonna help other people and with a doctor's work is, is astounding and we need that and there's, it's hope. That's how I look at it, so it's very important. Well, Anastasia, I can't think of better words to uh, kind of wrap up our time here. I do want to ask if we could switch back to the slide mode. Just a couple things to share here before we end, and I'll just do it very quickly. Just know that our efforts uh, continue on in terms of the things that we are offering each month. So again, you'll be able to go to tempe.gov backslash DFT for added information. And if I could have the next slide, and again, the, the slide deck has been made available to each one of you, but just know that we have some upcoming Dementia Friends sessions. This is a, an awareness campaign 
because without understanding first, you have to have awareness about what dementia is and how you can make a difference as a friend. And we've got some friends champions. So you heard our council member uh, Garland say that she is a champion. We'd invite you to become a champion. And I think our final slide maybe offers, um, yes, our memory cafe still meets virtually um, on the first and third Monday. And uh, we'd love to add you to our email list if you're not part of that. And again, we continue to have monthly lectures too to support uh, our family members and our community members to be their best. It's 12 noon. Uh, hopefully we accomplished what we set out to do, which was to help us understand that we still can live well during uh, these uncertain times with dementia, whether we be affected person, a family care partner, or community member who is interested. I wanna thank you uh, to our City of Tempe employees who have taken time today and for our panelists and particularly great thanks to Carmen and Anastasia for representing the real reason we do this work. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you.